EDSAC is the first practical computer of the modern kind. One of the most complex electronic systems of its time. And that enabled new kinds of science. EDSAC is physically quite large, 20 feet by 20 feet. It weighs two tons, drinks nine kilowatts, contains three and a half thousand valves, which made it one of the most complex electronic systems of its time. On the 6th of May, 1949, it ran its first program. It was a very simple program. It printed out a table of squares and we have an entry in the logbook that tells us it worked. But by November of 1949, the machine was reliable enough that they held a conference in Cambridge to tell people about EDSAC and what it could do. And the programme it ran as its demonstration at that conference was to produce prime numbers. And to compute prime numbers, you have to have a machine that can take decisions. And that's one of the formal definitions of a computer in the modern sense. EDSAC was about 1,500 times faster than a student with a mechanical calculator. So you got your results faster and you could do much bigger calculations and that enabled new kinds of science. The Cambridge machine was deliberately built so that scientists, mathematicians at Cambridge could use it to carry out calculations to advance their research. It supported three scientific groups at Cambridge to win Nobel Prizes. And in their Nobel acceptance speeches, they all mention EDSAC as if it was one of their scientific collaborators. When I was in the computer lab in the in the mid-70s doing my PhD, EDSAC was very much part of the mythology and the folklore of the lab. So I thought it'd be interesting to actually build one and see how it worked. We started the reconstruction project in 2010, 2011. We recruited a volunteer team to work on the machine. One of the volunteers built what today we would call a logic simulation to understand what the various parts of EDSAC were and how they would fit together. The early computing pioneers didn't leave very good records behind. Once they had built a machine and found out how it worked and how people used it, they wanted to get on and build the next one. And indeed, one of the frustrations for us as modern engineers trained in modern software and electronics is working on this reconstruction. We have to forget a lot of what we were taught to go back to the 1940s. So we're kind of doing archaeology. <laughs> And when that logic simulation was able to run simple programs, then we knew we had a very high-level outline design of the machine. Then different volunteer groups took different parts of that logic design and they designed the electronics. EDSAC was built using thermionic valves. Inside is a glass bottle with a complex array of electrodes. From the point of view of building a computer, you can think of it as an electronic switch. You can turn it off and on, and that gives you a way to represent ones and zeros. You can also use it as an amplifier, which is a way you can regenerate signals as they go through the computer. We're standing inside EDSAC now. This first row, the center of it, is what we call the clock and digit pulse system. That's the beating heart of the machine. They tell the rest of the machine what to do. This rack right in front of me is the input output system. The two racks there are what um, work the memory system and drive the delay lines. The middle row of the machine is what today we would call the central processor. In the original EDSAC, it was called main control and it's the part of the computer that fetches instructions out of memory, decodes them, and tells the arithmetic unit, which is in the next rack, what it is supposed to do. Okay, then we'll dive to the next row. It has the circuits that know how to add, subtract, and multiply, and do the other mathematical functions that EDSAC carries out. So you've got three rows, across the rows, about 140 individual chassis and together that's all the electronics in EDSAC. In a modern machine, 
they're replaced by transistors and those transistors are inside microchips and you would have millions if not billions of transistors. So the modern technology is really increased in scale what you can do. Because it was designed to be a machine that provided a service to the university, they thought about how to make programming easy. On other machines, you had to write your programs and your data in binary and punch them on a paper tape or even flick switches on the machine to get the data into the computer. On EDSAC, they invented a very simple programming language. You typed your program using letters and numbers. You typed it onto a piece of paper tape. That's the EDSAC Hello World program. And um, if you put that through a teleprinter, you can read it as letters and digits. You feed that into the machine. EDSAC knows how to decode that into the binary form of the instructions and data and runs your program. They also provided diagnostic programs you could run after your program that could print out what was in the memory so that you could see how the program had changed data. The original machine, the operators would work from this operator's desk. Next to it was a paper tape reader for reading in programs, a teleprinter for printing out the results. These screens let you see what's going on inside the machine. The top three are showing me some of the internal, what we call registers, which is where the, the working um, calculations are being done. This screen lets me see what's in the memory of the machine. The dots are the, the ones and the blanks are the zeros. So that's my very simple program. And this screen is showing me what instruction the machine is executing. That's all that's required to operate EDSAC. Why bother building a machine from the 1940s? The important thing is to be able to show the, the history of computing, how it has developed from machines like EDSAC, which were physically huge, but actually very simple, through to modern microelectronics. I'm sure the pioneers who built EDSAC had no idea how the technology would develop in the succeeding decades. So by modern standards, it's very small, it's very slow, but in its day, it was competing with a PhD student sitting at a desk with a book of logarithm tables or a hand calculator, and it won that battle hands down.